How's it going, guys? Hey, what's up? Hey. I'm Nate. Phil, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Phil. Nice to meet you. Jay, thanks awesome. for coming out today. Yeah, thank you. We'll talk about this <laughs> Hi guys, uh, Phil here from Ecopreneur Media. Welcome to our show. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel and check out our website for more exclusive content for Ecopreneurs. Here with me today, I have the Robertson family from Bohannon Farm. Say hey guys. How's it going? How's it going? Awesome. So we're, today we're gonna be taking a tour around their place and just checking out what they got going on over here and looking at how they um, incorporate sustainability and environmental sound practices here. This is uh, my wife's family's farm. The boys okay. are the fifth generation to grow up here. Her great-grandfather fell in love with the woman across the street and they no bought way. the farm over here and that was in 1907. So when he bought it there wasn't a tree standing on it like much <laughs> of New England land right. um, and now we've got about uh, what about 300 acres of forest that we that we actively manage. It's grown from uh, he kind of had a team of horses and, and a cow to feed the family and sell some extra stuff in town to a uh, a fairly average sized New England farm, so we milk about uh, 200 mature cows is what we have here, okay. and then about 150 young stock to back them up. But to bring the three boys back, to bring that fifth generation back, rather than growing the herd like we've done for the last four generations, mm -hmm. we decided to add on a glass bottled milk business. There you go, so, so Contuka Creamery. Contuka Creamery yeah. that we okay. deliver around central New yeah. Hampshire, okay. and, uh, and returnable glass bottles. Yeah, and, awesome. And that's cool. kind of what we're doing to bring the boys back. And how do you pronounce it, Contuka or Con? And how do you spell it? Lots of people. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's C O N T O O. Okay. C O O K. Gotcha. Okay, of course, it came sense. from. Right. It's a Native American word. Mm. Um, I think it means many crows. Is that many crows? Something okay. loosely translated. Right. Which, which we have. Interesting. We have many crows around still. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it has right. been. This farm has been farmed since long before white settlers got here. Wow. It's, uh, so we have many areas where, where the Native Americans were were farming it long before. That's interesting. We, were. we pronounce it Kentucky. Okay. With the cows, the way I really focus on sustainability is making the most efficient animal possible. Mm. I mean, we can do that in a few ways, but for every bite of feed, I want a cow that's going to make the optimum amount of milk Definitely. because that's going to make our farm run smoother. Mm -hmm. It's going to be healthier for the cow. Mm -hmm. um, and the ways we achieve that is through feeding them a really high quality diet. We just hammer on making sure we have the highest quality forages we can make okay. through nutrition or soil nutrients, um, which is Sai, he'll talk about that later. Okay. But uh, when it gets to feeding the cow, we work really closely with the nutritionist who's got a ton of people behind him <laughs> to yeah. do all the research that we could never get around to doing or have the access to. Right. So um, through that, they figure out, you know, if we need however much magnesium added in, mm. more or less, that we're missing in our crops. It's very That's specific. That's gonna make yeah. the cows healthier, gonna make them more productive, yep. and um, they'll be more comfortable. Okay. So. The cows have a nutritionist. We yeah. run on junk food. <laughs> we, <so. yeah. laughs> well, Dad's a pretty good cook. So. <laughs> we make sure that the stalls are bedded well. We use a really nice sand bedding because that uh, keeps the cows as clean as possible. Mm. It's an anaerobic environment, so germs can't really grow, you right. know, if you were to use green sawdust, right. that's put more milk in that and that's harboring <laughs> such a good environment. Yeah. You know, we, we've been fortunate enough to have a sand pit where we can bed with really good clean sand and we've definitely noticed the, the impact and benefits of using that. And different farms have different things, but we happen to have a bug that does really well in okay. sawdust that makes cows sick, so, oh, no okay. so we don't use sawdust. It's just right. our environment, we so yeah. we have to adapt yeah. to it and make sure that we're staying on top of it and listening to what the cow is telling us. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. the, the, sands are, and the sands are real good inert organic matter that okay. it's, you know, doesn't harm the fields yep. or anything else. It's, it's very good for the cows. It's yep. terrible on equipment, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's, but it's good for the cows and it's good yeah. for the environment. So that's what we're really concerned about. Through breeding, I work really closely to make sure I'm making a better cow every generation. Mm. So, you know, feet and legs that'll last longer, and udder that'll stay up better, right. more production. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that no, I more can, efficient cow. more efficient cow is really what we're chasing down. And okay. I, I have a number that's called feed efficiency, you feed know, efficiency. on the index that wow. I get when I'm selecting sires. Wow. So okay. um, tracing that, they, it's just, if this one's better than that, I know probably I should be using him. Mm. Um, so that's the way, on my side of things, being managing the herd, that right. I really ensure we're as sustainable as possible and trying to, yeah, do as much as we can. <laughs> Definitely. 
So we're out here, uh, we're in uh, one of our corn fields. We're actually, the farm is right there. It's only a few hundred feet, or, yep. but, but uh, so we've actually been working on doing no-till uh, planting of all our corn for the last uh, three or four years, I think now, four, four years. Four. So this field was, was grass um, last year. And this spring we, we mowed our first cutting of grass off okay. it early in May. Mm -hmm. And then we planted our corn right onto it wow. and, and killed the grass off. And you can see there's still a bunch of dead grass in here that's yeah. that's working its way out which is important to us we want that organic matter here it, it holds water for us it uh, holds the ground in place and as I was going to show you it gives critters a lot of yeah mm -hmm. so it actually so and then and then it also helps prevent nutrient runoff because okay. it is it, yep. it holds on to the water and everything that that's water soluble you know gets held in there by the organic matter so it's here for the corn to take up so Later we can in the summer so mm. we can get it to our cows so if you, so one of the neat things is is that with the with the no-till we're actually uh, maintaining the structure of the soil so that um, the microbes and 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 the worms and stuff that are living you can see there's a little wormy guy right there oh, wow. and stuff and see how it's, it's nice and crumbly and yep. and so we're maintaining that soil structure so that the the ecosystem in the soil can work properly okay. to feed the corn is, uh, is what it really comes down to is that it's it's all it's all kind of about keeping that ecosystem here healthy and then that can work you know we got all we got all this organic matter that's yep. carbon that's mm -hmm. being sequestered. Sequestered, sequestered in the soil here and uh and and processed so that the corn to a to a way that the corn can take it up and use it for feed and then we can feed it to our animals. Gotcha. So it's all... So we kind of keep that carbon locked right up. You right. Know, you, you know, we hear about carbon with cows, but one of the things yeah. we do is, is we lock it up in our corn and our trees. Definitely. Um, oh, yeah. But, and, and uh, you know, you got those roots and stuff and, and those just, they, they leave those porous openings in there. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we've been finding through research that they've been talking to us about we work with USDA through Natural Resource Conservation Service. Oh, nice! And and we we work with them on and our uh, agronomist that we have that comes in. Yeah. But but keeping these roots there and letting those pores, it, it leaves the soil porous. And number one, the roots in the open pores hold water. Okay. So that we do a lot better. And we're kind of it's kind of one of the ways that we're trying to mitigate climate change. Okay. Is uh, number one when we get a huge downpour we have a place for the water to go so we don't have huge puddles and, and drown in the plants on top right. of the field. And then number two, it locks that water in. So it keeps it from just yeah. being a, a flash runoff and, right. and really eroding the soil and, and polluting the rivers with with the, with not just runoff, runoff but yeah. also just wasting all that. There's an ungodly amount of pressure stop soil that <laughs> yeah. just want to keep. It's like, right. and, no, and so, acres. So <laughs> just, it's a lot. And, uh, and then it gives it we're really concerned now about the bio that's just under the soil okay and that's you know we're doing cover cropping for yeah yeah so actually so after we take the corn off in in a couple more weeks here we'll actually plant uh we use mostly winter rye which is winter just rye, it's just yeah. a small grain crop that mm -hmm. we'll plant it in in the day to this field yeah so that it so that there's already something growing there even after the corn's off and then that stuff will grow right through the winter it's really hardy wow. yeah. so so it'll grow all winter long and and it'll do you know do the same thing that we're talking about here where mm -hmm. when where when we spread manure on here there's something growing there to take up those nutrients okay. and start working to uh you know keep it keep it all there for yeah. the springtime definitely the neat thing about it is is that it that it locks all that nitrogen and phosphorus up in the plant mm -hmm. And then, then we'll hit we'll hit the cornfield with manure in the spring, and that'll give it an initial charge of nitrogen okay. and phosphorus to get that plant started. Mm -hmm. And then later on in the summer, like about what about a month ago, right. that corn when it starts making the ears has another real need for nitrogen. Okay, and it's and it's decomposing in the ground what's right. been held in those plants so as we Definitely. get into year three and four and that decomposure it, it's like a time release nitrogen of our manure it's like an efficient system in itself it's just it kind of works in tandem with all the other seasons that come by and it too. also it's has great. saved us a ton of fuel you mm -hmm. know as far as we used to the, the old school thought on it was that we needed to get the manure incorporated into the ground immediately so that we yeah. didn't lose any nutrients to run off mm. um, so we used to spread manure and then run the tractors over to get heroin which is a very uh, 
fuel. It takes Intensive. a lot of fuel. It's <laughs> a lot Feel of, a lot of yeah. horsepower to run <laughs> yes. 18 yes. inches yes. down into the ground. Yeah, right. <laughs> so now we can spread that manure on top of a green plant gotcha. and let that green plant incorporate it into the ground and it does a better That's job right. and then releases it slowly and, and better as, as the plant moves. It. Definitely. So and, and we come up corn. with corn. Nice. And this isn't quite ready for cows yet. It, it's a, it doesn't taste very good to humans. <laughs> you get hungry enough while you're out chopping. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we skip lunch a lot. We do go after it, but it's uh, nice. Yeah. So and that would be for the green cows. Still. That's cow yep. corn. We're okay. still about yeah. still two weeks green. away from where we want it. Three weeks away. Wow. Watching that milk line drop. We want it to really almost dry down, not quite to where it's grain, but um. What do we want it for a dry matter? About, uh, about 30, 30 to 35 percent dry matter wow. is where we want it. So that's that's if you look at this, water. it'll yeah. actually it'll dry right down from the top, from mm -hmm. the outside of the kernel down to the bottom. Yep. And we want it. What is it like about two a thirds, a, a, a third, third of the way yeah. from the bottom? Gotcha. So that that's, that one didn't have as many, but this one had 18 kernels around it so that's a pretty good year of corn 16 yeah. and that means so that, that means we had a lot of water and, so, and right. that got decided back in like june <laughs> oh many, wow you yeah. know that's how long ago that's insane it has to have that second liquid nitrogen ready for it right. to put those on mm. and, uh, gotcha wow. yeah. and as it ferments too it actually becomes more digestible for the cows and the cows can do more with what they what they exactly. eat and what we're feeding the cows is the bugs that we grow in the rumen you know Perfect. cows have four stomachs right with the rumen being the first one and that's a big fermentation bath that's full of, of bacteria and good bacteria that we want to grow that bacteria and then a lot of their diet is mm -hmm. digesting that bacteria that's how come cows are able to eat mm -hmm. so many things that humans can't eat you right know, that's how come we can feed them so many byproducts yeah that, that come out of the human food stream sure. how come we can feed them the forages that we can't eat yeah. yeah there's so much land that you couldn't grow food production on right. that cows can utilize you know we were working on some fields that were on a hillside and covered in rocks and you aren't going to grow lettuce up there yeah, <laughs> exactly. yeah but no, you can sure. take the hay yeah. off and keep the land you know use it because right. pretty much all cows really are big solar panels you know all the plant <laughs> that they eat comes from <laughs> the sun and we see that production back to knowing whether we had optimum sun and water um you know we'll hit 95 to 100 pounds of milk per cow which is how we sell our milk and so that's you know 11 12 gallons of milk per cow per day wow. um and exactly. and on the cloudy cold summers with a lot of rain you know we struggle to make 10 gallons a day and it's all in that solar yeah, which is really neat. sun matters. The plants yeah. need <laughs> they get the majority of their nutrients from the air and the sun. Exactly, and they need the sun to grow. Right. Mm. So if it is to a cloudy, put the energy cool, in. Yeah, it, oh, that, so we rely a lot on the climate, <laughs> yeah, exactly. on the weather yeah. to do when one. it's okay. erratic. Yes. It <laughs> makes no. an un unpredictable industry even more volatile. But you know, yeah. it's it's kind of one of those things that just kind of floats over everybody's head. But yeah. that's. That's really what we're doing with our cows, wow. is, is harvesting solar energy. <laughs> this is interesting. So like, foods apparently. Cover boots. I wonder how that's going to work out. This <laughs> is looking great. <laughs> yeah, we got to be careful. There's a huge. So here's where everything on the farm ends up. All the whole point of everything that we've seen today is to get milk into here and put in bottles over here. Uh, we finished this in, in the end of May, finally, uh, after about <laughs> three and a half years of working on it, since we started laying ground and moving stuff around to fit everything in, buying stuff up. Uh, well, like we said when about the hail a few years ago, that really set us back about eight months probably in construction because uh, we had a trench dug and we were right. literally having concrete laid the next day and then everything got washed back in. So, oh, so we believe in pasteurized milk. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, we, don't, we don't sell raw milk on our farm. We, okay. it, happy if you do, happy if you like it, but we're not comfortable selling it. We're comfortable selling pasteurized milk. Mm -hmm. So that's what we do here is pasteurize and bottle the milk. So. Pasteurized and homogenized. Yes, yeah, uh, standardized. Standardized. Uh, actually, our whole milk comes out straight out of the cow. Uh, yeah. We don't do any fat percentage adjustment for it. It's just okay. whatever comes out of the cow is what we sell in our whole milk, which wow. is, makes it about, we like to say, 96% fat free. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of milk do you guys prefer? Like, when you drink uh, it? Chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> I mostly drink the, the whole milk. Yeah. The whole milk. We don't even drink any raw milk. We were raised on it. And but, probably my uh, favorite tap and half in my coffee. <laughs> <laughs> so we have 
These two pipes are on the tank here that go over the front over the belt room. These two pipes can go down. It gets pumped through these lines here, and uh, this isn't set up right now, but uh, it goes through the cream separator for okay. everything other than our full milk products. Uh, this is just a giant centrifuge that spins off everything, spins it around. And you sit it in the bottle, I want to homogenize it off the cream rises to the top, right? The cream uh, rises yeah, to the top, you know, that's, that's where the saying right. comes from. Right. So the centrifuge just speeds that up, mm -hmm. speeds up that, that timeline that it takes gotcha. to rise, rise the cream to the top. And then we take the cream off and use that for ice cream in half and half. <laughs> so we heat the milk. I don't really work with the pasteurizer, that's mostly dad. Uh, but. We heat the milk up to 160 degrees for 20 seconds. Uh, it's really neat because the milk coming in cools the milk going out. So we have, so milk going out is coming out at 160. The milk coming in should be coming in below 40 degrees. So, and then we have uh, a glycol chiller too, which is just pretty much a high sugar solution. That it does a really good job of cooling and keeping itself cold. We actually froze our pasteurizer a couple weeks ago because <laughs> we were we were trying to mess with something else. But um, so the milk comes out of the pasteurizer and goes into one of these three holding tanks, which we have a really good setup because we can pasteurize a lot more stuff than we can hold at once. Right. So if we have more of these tanks that we have, the faster we can get the pasteurizer done and start washing that up, and then. These pipes switch around here and go over to the filler there. Okay. The bottle, there's a bottle washer on the other side of this wall here, and the bottles come right out of the washer, come down this conveyor belt, okay. and then there's one of those gears over there fits in right here, pulls the bottles right onto here. There's a valve that gets, as this plate comes up, opens up the valve, and the bottle fills just gravity fed, and then it's full by the time it gets to the other side, where it grabs a cap off this, and it goes around this and gets the cap pressed right there. If we go with glass bottles here because reuse is better than recycle. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we sterilize the bottles when we get them back and yep. then run them through and fill them up again. I love we it. Think it's pretty good, we think it's a pretty good system. Yeah, definitely. And it, uh, it gives us a little differentiation between the rest of the milk in the store too. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we really feel that the milk in glass tastes a little better than milk coming yes. out of glass. Mm. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> One of the neat Most things about, about the pasteurization system that Bram was talking about is we decided to go with what we call a high temperature short time, which is HDSB. So there's three different types of pasteurization. There's vat pasteurization, mm -hmm. which is you bring it up to 140 degrees and hold it for 20 minutes. Wow. There's high temp short time, which is what we do, which we bring it up between 160 and 180 and hold it for between 20 and seconds and a minute. Okay. Um, and then there's then there's ultra high pasteurized, which is your shelf stable products, which we don't do. Right. But the pasteurizer runs at about ninety three percent efficiency once wow. it gets on it, clicking along. That's so super that, efficient. That's pretty cool. Yeah, you know? definitely. And, and that's uh, so because what we do here is it does take a tremendous amount of electricity in any place we can save it. Right. Definitely. Hopefully, in the future, yeah. we'll have a methane digester on farm to produce yeah. our own electricity and and recoup that methane and clean. Yeah. Methane is certainly one they talk about. We, yeah. we feel we feel a little defensive about that because mm. it is. They only talk about the methane from the right. food side of agriculture, mm. um, and, and we're a little skeptical about that. Mm. Um, and and uh, you know, horses don't get pulled into it. Pets don't get pulled into it. Right. We talk about pork and beef right. and dairy, um, and we work really hard to as as you see out in the cornfield to, to sequester a tremendous amount yeah. of that. And and we're in the process of working through our carbon footprint on farm. Um, but we feel really confident that between the 350, 350 plus acres of crops that we're growing yeah. and the 300 acres of trees that we have that, that we're pretty close to, we're hoping we're gonna come up as being a, uh, a carbon sink. Carbon um, sink, right. we haven't got yeah. that. We haven't got that math done yet, but mm -hmm. we're working on it. So you're working so, towards that. Uh, so yes. Another thing that I think does get missed a little on the methane cows debate is, uh, uh, that when you're talking about the the carbon that's coming from the cows, that's mm -hmm. that's carbon that's been cycling. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's 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 carbon that's out in the corn and it's cycling through the cows right. versus carbon that's coming out of the ground that's been stored away for a few hundred million years. So I think, well, well, I, I, I don't. You know, I'm not. I'm not a scientist. I don't. Yeah. I don't. I don't. I can't say with certainty that that's that. There's a difference. But to me, I think there is. 
something to be said for there is a difference in how the where the carbon's coming from right. as to how much of a s overall impact it has mm -hmm. on because well, one of the best one of the best things that I that I saw just recently was you know if you if you put five cows in your garage and a couple of sheep and a goat or two and go to bed at night you're going to be warm mm -hmm. and wake up in the morning <laughs> if you put your car in the garage and leave it running all night you're going to be dead mm -hmm. and I think you know so 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 like I said we're, we're fairly defensive about right. about that and and not not in a bad way we just like to explain to people that. Right. you know where the carbon's coming from that the cows are using how we're trying to sequester as much carbon as we can and mm -hmm. how many acres of carbon sequestering exactly. crops and and right. fiber that we like to tie up so, that's so that's just something that we yeah and that just as you know climate change is 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 an enormous thing you know you really it's all encompassing and you really have to look at the whole cycle when you look at when you look at things, look at problems with it and make sure you're not, you know, robbing Peter to yeah, pay Paul yeah. sort of thing. It's but, more like components to it rather than just right. kind of looking at one side. Of right. It. You really, you really got to look at. And we're kind certainly of the at the forefront of both working at preventing it mm -hmm. and at the forefront of the effects of of a change in climate. You mm -hmm. know, there's there's no two ways about that. That we're right. That, you know, and when we get when we get a hundred year storm that comes through and and prevents us from, you know, we lost 25% of our, of our grass last fall because we couldn't wow. get, it was just too wet to mow. Right. And we've been paying that price all year. Wow. And uh, yeah. yeah, that's that's a heavy hit. Yeah, definitely. 25% is a large portion. Yeah. So it is something that we're very concerned about and probably yeah. it affects our livelihood tremendously and, and trying right. to, and that's, you know, part of why we're in the local food movement with, yeah. with glass bottle milk and trying to keep our footprint Kind yeah. of local, you know, we, we travel, what's our farthest route? If we were to run straight, we're just over an hour. And, you know, in, in kind of all directions from yes. here. So it's kind of like so, a centralized. Yeah, we're, we're, and we're yeah. pretty proud of it, that we're trying to hammer that down and have invested heavily hmm. in time, yeah. labor, and money. Would you say that's a, a big, like, advantage to being like a local, small kind of business that caters to the people around you? you I know? think it's... It, that's what we're banking on, and it's <laughs> yeah. our and it's and it's our job to market that and, and convince people that that's something that they should pay for. Definitely, and yeah. and that's more difficult than I think any of us thought it would be. Yeah, but but I think that's that's yeah. why that's why we're happy to talk to you about it. So this is yeah. what all the hard work and science goes into. It's worth it. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> this that's is a fantastic. Love, man. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> Five generations uh, of love, right? Oh there. yeah, no, feel it. <laughs> so you guys provide this also in um, Hannaford's. That's one of the. We do. Yeah. We, we cover. Uh, we get about a hundred plus or minus uh, wholesale wholesale customers. Okay. Um, we have uh, fifteen Hannaford stores, and then we have a Colonial Village store here in town, um, and okay. just a number of other farm stands all around nice. Central New Hampshire. We've been yeah. we've been selling glass bottle milk for about eight years, mm -hmm. um, building the market before we built the plant. Yeah. And. Uh, and now we've got our plant with plenty of capacity to handle all, all yeah. our milk. Uh, for for a year, for a year, this farm is pumping out about 12 million eight ounce servings a day a day. Oh, wow. a, week. Uh, a week, a week, a year, a year. Uh, <laughs> gotcha. 12 million <laughs> servings yeah. a year. We're good size. We're not huge, yeah. right? Um, but we're not tiny either. We're, we're kind of sure. right there in the middle. And, yeah. and marketing and just getting our message out there, and yeah. uh, and convincing people. Because we're not the cheapest brand on the shelf, mm -hmm. but convincing people that uh, that the local footprint, and uh, we like to say we're so local you can smell us. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, right. um, uh, and we mean that in a good way. But, yeah, but you know, when you drive by and smell stuff in the spring, mm -hmm. you know, we're out we're out spreading that organic matter and really doing our best to to, to reuse what we're making. There you and, go. Uh, and and one of the real one of the other real big selling points that we have is that. The milk that comes in a Kentucky Creamery bottle only comes from Bohemian Farm, mm. um, so you know it's it's a single source. I guess our last question to end up the show today is: you know, climate change is undeniable, unfortunately. Um, researchers and analysts say we have about a 10 to 10, 10 to 20 year period before um, the effects become irreversible. Um, what is your message to our viewers about climate change and how we can combat it effect effectively? I think I'll let the boys yeah. answer that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, so I, I, um, 
I really strongly think that um, that that relying on on making agriculture more efficient and understanding that while there are some imperfections in our practices, we are constantly moving forward to try to to work to make our systems more efficient and do a better job of improving our soils, which improves, you know, which which adds to the ability for those soils to sequester carbon, and that. Um, and I, I really think that they, it, that what it all comes down to is that it's really important to support agriculture and especially local agriculture because right. we're on the forefront of working to, to try and maintain that open space that's going to, that those, the, the crops and trees that we maintain have been sequestering carbon for billions of years and, right. and they, they're pretty good at it and yeah. we ought to, we ought to keep trying to support that. Definitely. Yeah. yeah uh, <laughs> I think Zion said, uh, pretty much summed it up very well uh yeah i guess i don't have much too much to add to what he said i guess i'll add it. you know yeah. when you when you pick up when you choose real milk over the plant-based varieties of of beverages that you're buying a local product mm -hmm. that's made right here in new england that is made green mm -hmm. um that stays close to your home even even if you're not buying our milk when you go into the stores, you're still buying milk out of the Northeast that your right. neighbors are raising. It's, it's an awesome food. The animals are well taken care of, and the environment is well taken care of. And I think that's that's really important and has been get, getting missed with trendy things. Mm -hmm. And uh, milk's been green since before green's been cool. <laughs> and then, you know, that's Definitely, yeah. Well, thank you so much for having us today. Well, thank you guys yes. for coming out. Thank Appreciate you. it. Appreciate thank it. you, Phil. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Phil. Thanks so much.